Wow, it's snowing in Columbus, Ohio. 38 degrees out there. 38. I'm here with, with my main man, uh, Joe Vitale. What's up? We got so much shit to talk about. We got a lot to talk about. Um, dude, thanks for being on the homeschooling show. Um, I didn't bring my guitar. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need it. I don't own one. You don't need it. Um, <laughs> okay, so where do I even start? Um, you guys know Joe Vitale. Uh, dude, drummer with Walsh for how many years now? I mean, you guys go back. I think this year makes 50 years. 50 years. <laughs> 1968? 72. I met him in 68. We started working together in yeah. 72. You were the original drummer in Barnstorm. That, yeah. that's, that album was in 1972, right? Yeah. And you you produced a lot of Joe's records, right? A bunch of it, a bunch yeah. Of them. yeah. Wrote um, with him a lot. Wrote with him a lot. Um, you played with, I, I'm just trying to remember all the stories. You played with Ted Nugent, uh, Derringer. Yeah. You played with uh, Carl G. Stills and Nash for how long? 30 years. 30, <laughs> only 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, man. Okay, just to give you a little backstory, uh, Joe is like a dad to me. Um, when I was just a nobody, just moved to Nashville. Remember? Yeah. 1992, I moved to Nashville. Yeah. You were kind enough to throw me a bone, invite me up to your house to record yeah. on some projects you were doing. Yeah, but I met you before that. Yeah. On that session we did. On that session with Joellen yeah. something? Joellen. I don't remember her name. Joellen somebody. Yeah, and uh, man, dude, I was just figuring out how to record, and you were so kind to me, man. Yeah, and, but when I, I uh, somebody in Cleveland gave me your name, because I had that session with that girl, okay. and I needed a guitar player. Right. And... Yeah, you know, I didn't know anybody up there, and and the keyboard player. You remember I, who it was? I don't remember his name. Anyway, he said, "Yeah, there's this kid. <laughs> <laughs> this is twenty-six year old kid." Yeah, uh, that's about what I was at the yeah. time. Twenty-six. Said, there's this twenty-six year old kid guitar player here in town. You, you want me to get get him? And I said, "Okay, twenty-six, really? Yeah, he ain't good. Is he any good?" <laughs> and he says, "He's pretty good." <laughs> So I said, okay, yeah, bring him over, whatever. And that was Dale Peters from the James Gang. No played shit. bass with us. How did he know me? No, it wasn't Dale that knew you. Oh, I see. It was the keyboard player. It was the keyboard player. On that session, I see. though, Dale Peters played with us. Right, Dale. In the James Gang. Right. So, so I, because I knew Dale, I had a bass player. Right. I knew. Right. And, and Dale brought the keyboard player in, and yeah. then he brought you. So awesome. you showed up with, I think you brought, like, one guitar or something, yeah. like a, a telly or a strat or something. Yeah. And um, you plugged in and started warming up, and I looked over at the keyboard player and went, yeah, he'll do. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that's when we met, man. That yeah, was dude. 94. 94, Can dude. you believe that? Oh, dude. And you, you used to let me stay at your house, remember, yeah, with yeah. your sweet wife, Susie. We, we, uh, we uh, did some recording there. and. Uh, dude, are the, we got to get those records out, man, those little recordings that we did. Yeah, man. I got oh, them all. You got them all? Got them we used to record on the ADATs, dude. I know, ADATs, uh, man. That was the thing, then. That was the thing. That was it. That and was I'm, before Pro Tools. Totally. And I remember your sweet wife would always get us those ho-ho cakes. Ho-ho cakes, man. Oh, know? dude. Those were good days, man. Good days, man, for and sure. And then you became a star and moved to Nashville. <laughs> yeah. And you was like the uh, guitar player of the year every year. Yeah, right. And so, like, yeah. uh, now I got to get you two ho-ho yeah, cakes. Yeah, yeah, two ho-ho <laughs> cakes. Um, we're here in Columbus doing uh, the Vetsa gig. For, with Joe, we rehearsed yesterday. That was fun, wasn't it? Yeah, Joe Walsh and you and Nathan East, man. He's Nathan good. East, Nate, dude. Nate's great. He's amazing, right? And you play? We play with him a bit. I've never played. Me with neither. Him. Me or you? Yeah. It's our first, first time. time he's before. awesome. And then Will Hollis from the Eagles, right? Playing keys. Right. He's playing keys with us. And uh, it's fun, man. We had so a good great. rehearsal. Yeah, so great. You, uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize about you is that you fucking wrote. Pretty Maids all in a row off the Hotel California album. Yeah, me and Joe did. You yeah. and Joe wrote that. Yeah. Tell me anything you remember about, about well, that. Joe had these verses, and they're cool. The verses are cool, and he says, I, I don't know where to go. 
you know, was it? You know, I, I write like everybody writes like that. Right. They write bits and pieces. And you get stuck. And you get stuck. And, and it's like, okay, you put that on the shelf next, and you start. You got this new idea, and you get excited about that, and you forget about this idea. So he, he said, uh, I'm trying to write some stuff for Eagles Hotel California, and he says I got this one little thing. He says, but I, I don't know what to do with it. I said, well, let me hear it. What did he have? He had. Hey there, how are you? You know, just a sure. verse. Right. He had the verse. And seven, you know, you know. And so I, and, he, and that's all he had. So when I heard that little change going to the seven, I said, Ah, I know where to go. So I sat down and I played these things and hummed like a little melody. And he was like, Whoa, that's it. Where are you going? Wait a minute. Let's, let's record that. So I wrote the chorus. Wow. And um, and uh, and it kind of completed the song. Wow. And, I mean, everybody does that. You have bits and pieces, and somebody comes along and and you know, and and finishes for you. I do that all the time. I got so many bits and pieces. I can't finish it. I need somebody to I hear it. it. And where would you go with it? It's a place that I would never go. With collaboration them. is yeah, the collaboration. best thing in music. I, you know, it's like. Yeah. Like the the great collaborators of our life, you know, yeah. Lennon McCartney, come on, totally. you know, Simon Garfunkel. The, 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 there's so many. Siegfried the, and Roy. Yeah, Siegfried <laughs> and Roy. Uh, no, wait, <laughs> Abbott Costello. <laughs> Abbott and Costello, oh, you know, um, yeah. uh, uh, Ralph Cramden and Norton. <laughs> Such. Killer songwriters, right? Oh man! So anyway, so he brought it to uh, he brought it to Glenn Fry and Don Henley, and and they they liked it, and so but nobody, you know, I wasn't writing for a song for Hotel California. Sure. Hotel California hadn't even been made yet. Right. I was just kind of helping him write a song. Right. And then it, it and I knew it was going to an Eagles record. Sure. But nobody knew how big that record was right. going to be, you know. So, right. but they liked it. They did a killer job. Of the vocals were killer. Oh, they sure did. And and um, just one of them things, you know. Man, I'll bet you when that record came out and you saw that on there, you were like, hell well, I, yes. I was freaking out. And one yeah. one of the things a lot of people don't know, if if you look it up, the the single Hotel yeah. California on the 45 yeah right remember the 45 vinyl sure. the flip side was pretty made all in oh damn and i i think it's they 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 were maybe throwing joe a bone by you know the, the, he's kind of new to the band right you're gonna put you know, that was 1976 B-side. he was brand new to the band did you make more money having a b-side back in those days like did that how it no worked? no if you B sides or A sides made the same money. Same money. Okay. Yeah, that's why a lot of guys like James Brown right. used to put uh, uh, whatever song, and it would be part one. Right. And then on the <laughs> side, right. he just called it part two and made a few changes, and he'd get twice the money. Yeah, oh man, dude, <laughs> that's, that's I, cool. <laughs> man, in those early days when I used to come and hang with you, I learned so much about recording from you, man. Just you, you, you're very like. You're one of those guys that can build and fix anything. You, you're kind of, and Walsh is the same way, right? Yeah. Real mechanical. I, yeah, I, yeah. I was forced to because where I live, I'm kind of on my own. Yeah. You know, I can't just call like where you are, man. You, right. You, every great player and singer is within walking distance totally. from you. Totally. Everywhere. Right? And so I had to learn how to, to, and I'm still learning. Yeah. I had to learn how to do a lot of stuff like that, but. And I'm glad, you know, it's always been a pain not being able to pick up the phone and somebody down the street, this awesome, you know, right. player or singer. Right. Or but, you know, nowadays with the internet, it don't matter where you live. It's you know, true. You make a call and you phone it in, man. Right. Just go online and. Did you ever move to LA for a minute or anything like that? Did you ever? I, I never, I, I was in LA half of my life. Right. Just but I, I, I never wanted to live there. Right. It was just too crazy for right. me. Too Dude. busy. Yeah. I live in Ohio where there's like, yeah. I used to leave LA, going on the interstates to the airport, hoping that I'd even make it to the airport so late. 
Yeah. Then wow. you land in Ohio and there's like no cars, I no know. traffic. You get the whole place yourself. It was just, just relaxing. Yeah. You know? I mean, I, I love LA. It was fun. We had a great time there. But yeah. To go home to something, you need to go home to where it's just, yeah. everything's laid back. And totally. Just, so you can relax, you know. You got a beautiful house there. I see why you love it so much. Well, it's, it's, it's like, it's just home, you know. Yeah, it's man. quiet. There's right. nothing going, you know. Sometimes it's not good because there's nothing going on. Right, right. But we're well, um, close to the Football Hall of Fame. Yeah, close to the Football yeah. Hall of Fame. And we're close to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah, that's right. You know. Um, uh, I remember you telling me a story one time that absolutely cracked me up, man. But it's a bit heartbreaking about the uh, about the Rocky Mountain Way thing, about how you guys used to have to split up all the the writing credits on those songs. Well, you know, <laughs> back then... Back then, that everybody did that. That's what you then, did, right? You know, and and it's like, um, uh, a lot of people got credit that really didn't do anything. Didn't do much. <laughs> so that used to piss off a lot of the other writers that actually did something. Right. You know? So you you and Joe went in the studio that day and basically made Rocky Mountain Way. We made that yourself record. Yeah, and uh, I was fooling around with that lick over E. Right. E D D D E. Right. And I, I used to play that in. Because you're an amazing piano player. A lot of people don't know this. Well, I'll, I'll I write on keyboards, you know. Yeah, I, sure. I, I, and flute me. player. Well, flutist. Those are those are you know. Yeah. If he's. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, so I played that riff, and um, Joe was really getting good on slide. Yeah. Dwayne, he his favorite slide player back then was Dwayne Allman. Sure. Dwayne died around 71, 72, yeah. something like that. Right. And Joe thought, okay, I've got to pick up the reins, take, it, take over. And, and when he first started playing slide, uh, uh, and I've told him this before, I, I said, you're not very good at that. <laughs> he was like, and your guitar people will dig it. The, he was out of tune, and his vibrato was way too fast, yeah, you know? Yeah. And I said, man, you're not very good at that, are you? And he goes, well, I'm learning, I'm learning. And so he learned, he got Boy, he good did. real fast. It's recognizable style. Very slide recognizable. Player. And he's top five right. slide players For in the sure. world now. And, but, but because he got really good by, you know, he started picking up, he played slide with the James Gang, right. Right, but very little. Very little. Barnstorm, a little more. Right. But he started really woodshed slide. Sure. And he got real good. He right. discovered, you know, the open E tuning, whatever you guys call that. It's right. just like an E chord. Right. And, uh, you know, raising the, the action, of course. I, I'm not a guitar player, but I understand yeah. all that. Right. And he started getting good. Yeah. And started creating, developing a, a style. Right. That, that was Joe Walsh. Right. right. And so when he, and Bill Simzik, our producer, he started hearing stuff like that. And he goes, you guys need to, write something like features Joe's new talents right. on the slide. So, you know, what better than a slow blues and E? <laughs> Amazing. So so we, 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 we sat down and we he kept hearing me play this riff. He said, play that some more. And then he took it to the four, duh, you know, right. of course. And, and, and then he was living in Colorado and looking at the mountains and then put these lyrics together and all right. that. And, it was never a throwaway track. It was a cool track. Sure. But we never thought it was going to be his like flagship song. You know, most played FM radio song of the seventies. Is it? Was it not? Yeah. I mean, we got Billboard awards for like millions of airplay. And yeah. you guys, you and Joe wrote it together, but the other cats got credit for writing it. They weren't even there. <laughs> well, Kenny was. Kenny was okay. The bass player. <laughs> right. And right. Uh, and he, uh, you know, he was he was in on you yeah. know, the, the developing of the song. And he came up with that amazing bass part that yeah. makes the track. It makes the track. Doom, 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 doom. No one knows the right no, way to I play know. that. Everybody yeah. that when when I go to places, people want me to sit in and play Rocky My Way. I tell the bass player, don't ever hit D, first of all. Right. <laughs> never. they go, don't, don't. Oh no, 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 don't ever hit never, the D. The never. magic is the D over the E over D. You yeah, know? Hitting anyway, sharp note. Yeah. And, but the bass part, so me and Joe and Kenny really put that together. And the keyboard player got credit because Joe wanted to have a band song. And right. he wasn't even at the studio that day. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's like, what are you going to do? It's, it's yeah. too late to change anything. And I, I'm, I'm grateful that right. I'm part of it. I don't, I don't care. But yeah. Now, he wasn't, you know, sometimes you go, 
wait a minute, he wasn't even there. Yeah. But but it's cool, you know. I appreciate that that Joe's g generosity. Right. And, you know, but uh, you you know, uh, but th that's the way it went down, and it was one take. One take. One take. That was the first take. Holy shit. Yeah, the first take. And what we did was we cut bass, drums, and Joe Telly, I think, he played right. on it, I think. That was the basic track. Then I played grand piano on it. And then that was it. That was in Florida. And then we took those tapes to Colorado. That's where Joe did slide, right. vocals, and I did the synthesizer junk. In the Which middle. is amazing. Yeah, it came out good. And so, yeah. but we cut that basic track three piece, which made sense. That synth shit is Take so funky. It's a collab Take synth. Take one. Take one. Yeah. Okay, one of the things I've always heard you talk about in all the endless grilling, I've grilled you questions about <laughs> all this shit when we were up at your house and stuff. I remember you always saying what a genius uh, Bill Simzik, the producer, was. Bill Simzik, yeah. You guys loved him, didn't you? I mean, loved still him. love him, yeah. Still, still love, love him. him. And, uh, like, I remember you telling me that story about how he pieced together Life's Been Life's Good. Life's Been Good, yeah. Like, because that was several different songs, yeah? He, Joe brought in three or four songs. Right. One was a kind of a Rolling Stones kind of vibe. Right. And you know, just that. Right. And that was supposed to be a song. He said, I got this riff, because Joe's all about riffs. Right. Got like any riff. proper guitar player. Yeah. 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 And so he got this, and, and so and we, we jammed on it. It was like, oh, this is cool. Then he goes, he brought, he picked up his 12 string acoustic or acoustic or something, and, and he goes, and it was more like he wanted to get in next to like a Zeppelin kind of thing. Da -da 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 right. At first, I was playing time to that, you know, and it was like, that's cool. Right. Then he, he loves reggae. Joe loves reggae. Right. So, so we played the little reggae part. So we used to cut these things in the studio with Bill Simzik and just kind of let them sit, you know, just like yeah. go, just we don't want to forget these ideas. So, yeah. Yeah. So just record them and just have. And so, those four, three, four things. Then we had that middle section with the synth. Joe wanted to do a sequencer thing. You know, right. right. So. You gotta explain to us how you did that as well, because I would love to know that, yeah, that crazy we, synth part. We, we went home for the weekend. Right. We come back on Monday, and Bill Simsy goes, sit your asses down. He was so excited. He was so happy, so thrilled. I suppose part of it was he was hoping we'd be happy too. Right. <laughs> He said, sit down, listen to this. And we sat down, he put the big speakers on, yeah. cranked it, and it was like that. Doom, doom, doom. I knew that part, because that right. was, And he had edited the whole thing together as a complete song. The only thing was missing was the middle section with the sequencer. So um, Joe said, well, we were ecstatic. We were like, I love this. This wow. is it all worked together, right? And he made a he made a masterpiece out of this thing, right? Out of these little bits, right? But and the lyrics couldn't have been done, right? Because, no, because nothing with yeah, no lyrics. Right, were right, right. So Joe says we need to we need to develop. So we spliced in, we cut in the synthesizer part, right? And to develop that, we first developed the sequencer part, and right. then we played to that. Was that an ARP twenty six hundred? ARP twenty six hundred right. with the old with the sequencer, which was the second. Uh, and right. it, was, it was a plug-in, I mean, like an extra unit right. that went with the ARP 26. Right. And all that was like an eight-track sequencer. Right. It was all analog. And <laughs> what was funny was when we first developed it, Joe said, I, I, I'm tired, I want to go home, let's sleep on this, we'll come back, you know. And, and so we didn't realize it, we shut everything down. Right. right. But with analog synthesizers, the next day when you turn it on, right. it was all different. Yeah, it was out of tune. We, so we went back to the drawing board. We should have recorded it. Right. And so we got it back, and and um, we recorded it. Then I played uh, immediately. Put a drum track on it, so we'd have some time. Right. All I did was play to the sequencer. And that's got to be you doing that flange piano. And, yeah, I played piano, right. and then the synth bass. Yeah. And then uh, Joe um, played his lead, Amazing. and Bill cut it into the track. And, and so some of the shit that's 
on the final version of Life's Been Good was actually cut in those three different pieces. Yeah. You didn't have to go back and recut the whole thing. After never you, did. Wow. We never cut it again. We never cut it as one song. Holy shit. We, we, and we never cut it. We never went back and did anything because each riff that we did, we, we did that for like two, three minutes because Joe wanted to get in his head and write some lyrics, you know, whatever. He never did write lyrics to that because there, there's no lyrics on it. Right. There's no vocal on that right. section. Which is one of the most amazing acoustic sounds ever yeah, recorded. Yeah, cool. What the fuck was that? It was just probably compressed, crunched to death. God. It was, you know, KM84, crunched to death. You so know, and, good. And all the verb on those, that record was, you know, the old days, it was tube EMTs. Right. Just the great stuff. And Ty, Cooper Time Cooper Cube. Cooper Time Cube, which, which we need we to talk love, about. Let's talk about that. love. And so... My favorite effect. So we... After this thing was done, totally done, instrumentally, the track was done, yeah. then Joe wrote the words, which are perfect. The, it, the story is it's perfect. Amazing. And so it, it's, uh, it was creating a, it became a, a masterpiece. It contains one of Rock's greatest all-time lines. I can't complain, but sometimes I still do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a lot Did you write any of those words? No. You didn't? No. Those Shit. are all okay, that's no, all I didn't write any of those lyrics. That's amazing. Okay, so... Oh, dude. Okay, you told me one time. I remember all this shit. I, everything you told me, I remember. <laughs> uh, that the odd beginning of life's been good right. was an accident. Kind of an accident. Right. right. How did that happen? Well, I played it just two, three, four, boom, God. boom, boom, boom. Right. And what happened was Joe was excited to get started. He said, "Come on, let's go." He said. I said, you want me to count it off? She said, no, don't count it off. You start it. Just start it. So, and Bill's in the control room, right? And so I, I started, and as soon as I hit the foot, Bill goes, oh, shit. And he hit record. Oh, shit. Right? It, and, and Bill was mad at us. Then he says, next time you guys start song, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, it, it, it's, but we cut the track. Yeah. This was only the first part, remember? Right. This was the da 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 right. We hadn't even done those other parts yet. Right. We didn't even know what we were doing. We just recorded this first segment. So anyway, so we go, let's just check it out, see if we're in the right pocket, the tempo's good. Let's see if what we got. Right. So we go in there, and as soon as we get in there, as soon as it goes, he goes, guys, I'm sorry, man. I said, let me let me know next time you're going to start. So I missed that first bass drum. He says, but he says, I can cut one in easy. Yeah. Edit. And he could. He could easily yeah. edit it. He was a master. He said, a mas master yeah. with a razor blade. He was a yeah. surgeon. Yeah. So... Um, well, we said, well, don't worry about that right now. Let's just hear what our groove is and all that. So it, it hits play and it goes, bap, doom, doom, doom. Yes. And, and it throws you because you think the snare is one. Yeah. You know? And then the guitar comes in and turns you. And then we, we said, stop, stop. And we said, don't touch it. Right. It's perfect. Yeah. We love it. Like, he said, no, no, I got to put the, no, don't touch it. It's killer. Yes. Like, what yeah. are those things, man? Yeah. Don't fuck with ma a magic. When it happens, you don't get fuck so with lucky, you know? Yeah, I mean, so you, you don't mess with magic, man. Yep. And so, uh, and not that it was so ingenious, but it worked. Right. So leave it alone. Right. You know, and so, and, and he goes, and then he grew to love it, you know? Right. And I said, uh, I said, I'll tell you what, Bill, and this is 40, 50, right. 40 years later, I said, right. I'll tell you what, Bill, let's not tell anybody that, what happened and right. keep it magic yeah. but at this point in my life I don't care it's a great story <laughs> people need to know <laughs> yeah, I remember you telling me one time that, that one of your first gigs was riding around in a car with fucking Ted Nugent uh, tell us about scary, that scary man what was that like drove like crazy speeds and fast it's like you were like what 20 years I old I was 70 I was 21 years 21 old 21 years old and, and six of us in a station wagon with our luggage in the back, three and three luggage, and, and his brother was a roadie, and he Ted drove brother. a 12-foot truck with all our gear, and they would go ahead of us. I don't know when they slept. Wow. Because they, we didn't have tour buses or airplane. We couldn't afford any of that back then. And so it was, it was nuts. I played with Ted for about uh, six months. Right. 
And one of the shows we did, we opened for the James Gang. Yeah. I knew Joe from for two years already, so it was great to see them guys, my friends, and hang with Joe. And Joe said, come to the, my room afterwards, let's hang. I said, yeah, man. So he said he wanted to do something different, and you want to come out to Colorado and start a new band with me. I, and I had just been with Ted for a, a long enough to go, yeah, 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 let's do something. Because, yeah, I, I wasn't one of those Detroit rockers kind of guys back then. More artistic. Or yeah, well, I like, more. I was more like the kind of music that James Gay did or Joe right. or, you know, that kind of thing, you know. Sure. And, well, I liked playing with Ted. It was right. fun, but uh, it wasn't my thing, you right. know. And so when Joe said that, I said, absolutely. So I, I uh, flew out to Colorado and we started Barnstorm. Killer. Man, you told me, you know, you, the other people on my channel that watch the show they all know what a Genesis Phil Collins freak I am yeah. and you you're good friends with Phil yeah yeah and he's you told me one time that that he's he stayed right behind you on a, on a gig one night and watched you yeah like right from behind your kit yeah I got, you. I got a call from Phil to do his face value tour damn and I was so bummed because he came to our show it was Crosby Stills and Nash he came he, right. Atlantic Records reached out to me and said, hey, Phil Collins wants to find you or talk with you. And I said, what? Phil Collins? He goes, yeah. I said, well, give him my phone number. Right, please. Remember, this was before these. Yeah, and, this before. Internet, nothing. In, in the early night, even. This it before was, that. Yeah, yeah, 80s, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he finally found me, and he called me, and he said, hey, I want to come to your show at CSN, right? And I went, oh, man. He says, I'm... I'm going to be in Detroit. You're playing at Pine Knob. Can I come up and see you? I said, are you kidding? Come up. So he came up and I played the show. He was, that's not the show he stood behind. Me, though. Oh, that, okay. He watched the show. And then at that, that, after the show, he said, listen, I, 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 ever since I heard Rocky Mountain Way, that pocket you played, he says, I want you to be my drummer on Facebook. I said, oh my God, I'm oh, like in heaven. Here, right? Dude. I'm saying, pinch me, you know, like, and I go, are you kidding? When? He goes, we start rehearsing in two weeks. Damn. I went, no. Because that was the Pine Knob show he came to see us. That was our first show of the oh. whole tour. And I can't do that to a band. I cannot walk out of a tour. I can't do that. So I now, give my word, and that's I'm there. 40, so, 40 years later, brutal honesty. Uh, you know, what do you wish? You I wish I had to play with Phil Collins. You, you should have taken a gig. You right. know why? Right. Because with a proper notice, right. CSN could have gotten a million drummers. Right. They had a million drummers. And you know, I wouldn't do that ethically right. to them. Right. But I wish I had the time. And the, I mean, that would have been a golden opportunity for a drummer to be picked by Phil Collins. Dude. What a, an honor. And so I would have loved to. I loved that music anyway. Of course. I, lo I wanted to play with him just to do that drum fill sure. in, in the air tonight. <laughs> and I, uh, probably that gig would have been double drumming right. and dr me drumming and him out front, just like he did with uh, Chester. Uh, Chester. Yeah, right. And sure. so, but then years go by and um, he, we're in Europe and, and uh, at uh, Mont Montreux, mm -hmm. the Montreux Jet, and we're playing, and he lived in Switzerland. Right. So he came to the show. He brought his kid. This big, he's like eight years old or something. And they Simon. Huh? Yes. Simon. And yeah. they and they sat behind me on the stage and watched the whole. Time. I'm like a nervous wreck. It's like Phil Collins back there. But I, you know, I played the show, and so it was just great to see him. And um, um, sadly, he had that medical issues with his neck and his nerves and his hands, and and so his. His son grew up right. and he was playing with it. I think that's so awesome. It is awesome. You know? it and is. one of the things he told me, he says, you know, he says, I loved what you did with um, Rocky Mountain Way, the drum thing, right? So right. much that he says, you know, I wrote a song around that groove. I went, really? He goes, yeah, misunderstand. No I shit. Dun, 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 dun. No Think shit. about that. Off he the said Duke that, album. that yes, that's he said that was modeled that he didn't steal anything. It just yeah. a shuck, slow show. But he he said I modeled that groove you did for that song. I'll be Misunderstand. Damn. See, 
I've heard people compare that song to Hot Fun in the Summertime. Yeah, Hot by, by Sly. Fun. But right. He told me wow. that he said, well, I'm sure that was part of one of them songs too, but he said, right. that thing you did in that song, he said, I, I learned it, I played it, and I wrote a song last night. So, what a, what a Un- humbling thing. Unbelievable. Yeah, thing. unbelievable. And you you uh, you played on uh, Southern Cross, Steel, yes. Crosby, Stills and Nash. Southern Cross. What do you remember about that? Um, I remember that man. That song came together quick. Did it? Uh, I uh, because Joe Lala played percussion. Okay. And I don't know him. George Chocolate Perry on right. George Perry Chocolate on bass. He's a phenomenal bass player. And and Stephen was playing acoustic and. We had cut that track before, uh, and Mike Finnegan was yes. playing. And, and we had cut that track before David Crosby and Graham Nash arrived at the studio, because Stephen was like that. He said, "Nah, they don't want, they don't, they won't play on the track anyway. They just want to sing on this one, right?" So we said, "Well, let's cut it, right?" So we did about two, three takes, and we went in the control room. Who, like, who wrote the tune? That was Stephen with um, these brothers. Um, I can't remember their name. Okay. Two brothers and Steven wrote the song. Okay. Killer tune. Yeah, it's an amazing song. And and the feel of the track was just really great. And and so we cut that about two or three takes or so. But but we had been playing it live. I see. And that was one of Steven's things. He always loved the idea of if we're gonna record a song, let's play it for a couple of months live. Right. And just give the eye say, Hey, we're gonna do something new and he said, let's see what the audience does. You know, do they like it? Do you get, see if you're getting feedback from the audience. Right. If they if they just, at the end, if they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah then something's right. wrong with the song. Give it a golf clap. Yeah, give it a yeah. golf clap. Yeah. But um, uh, that's a very good it is. thinking. That's it good is. thinking, because, and, and, and we used to get done with it, and then the reviews in the period, oh, this new song, so whatever. And Steve went, okay, we're cutting it. Right. It's a good idea. It is. Instead of throwing an audience a new album with all new songs, never been tried live. Right. You know, and you don't even know if you can play these things live. You know, that's what a lot of people get in trouble. Overproduced, too yes. many parts, too many, can't too many sing audience. that high, right. whatever it is, and you get out on the road and it's like, oh shit, we suck. Totally. <laughs> if you put an overdub on a record that is crucial to the record and you can't play it on the you gotta ha- you, you, you yeah. got to have it. And you yeah. know, People doing tracks now, and right. it ain't cool, it don't man. make it, man. You know, people didn't pay right. money to see you push a computer button, no, you know, space exactly. bar. Right. You know, that, that, that's not cool, man. And, and I, it, you'd be better off to hire somebody that can do those parts than to do. That. I mean, although you know, people do it and fine, you know, right. and that's what it is. Boy, but, everybody you know, does it. Now. We didn't do that for how many years, right. and we pulled it off. Right. You know, so it's like don't overproduce yourself. Exactly. You know, don't. Or hire people that can do those parts. Right. You know? Key parts. Um, yeah. Two things I always think about that you told me um, a long time ago. Um, you guys used to, to uh, back when the radio was huge, right? When when getting your songs on the radio was a big deal and the way it sounded on the radio. Sure. You guys were very concerned about the way your records would sound on the radio. Right. And I remember you telling me about how you, you had those portable radio stations or, or like oh, yeah. Yeah. so you could go out to your car the record plant in LA and you could hear it on your car yeah. stereo the it way it's going to sound a small very small radius uh, FM broadcasting and they had broadcast limiters I mean this thing was like a small radio station it only broadcasted about a, a hundred feet right so we used to play our mix and hit play on the tape would start and play the mix through the broadcast limiters. Those are the, what they use on radio stations. The actual thing. And you go out in your car and they would find a, a, a frequency on your, you know, way down low where there was no radio station. Right. So, and you'd get great reception because the, the station is right there. Right. The broadcast. And you could sit in your car with car speakers wireless through the airwaves, FM airwaves, right? You can sit in your car like you're gonna hear it. And it was amazing that what, how that dictated to you where your mix was at. Right. And you'd go, oh man, there's, there's no bass. Or, or God, the vocals are, you know, Too mid-range. Loud, and, yeah, and yeah. 
you know, or or it's perfect. Leave it alone. Right. So, um, what a great idea that was. Really cool, man. And you know, I I don't see why you, you shouldn't be able to do that today. I mean, mm -hmm. although it's a little technically, it's all digital systems now and all that. But I'll tell you what, it took your mix, ran it through the proper gear to put it wirelessly in the air and receive it mm -hmm. in a car uh, with car speakers and a car tuner and all that. And you got a, a perfect example of what your record would sound because back then it was FM radio was the you know first time you could have like stereo and uh, FM sounded way better and didn't get much interference but mostly it was stereo and you'd sure. get these great sounds. And so, um, um, uh, to, to hear what, you know, because sometimes you're, you'd put a record out and it, they, you, you know, the station would start playing it. Here's a new record, but you know, and they play right. it and like, man, it doesn't sound so good on right. a radio. It sounds great on a home system, but sure. not so good. You wanted it to, back then, you wanted it to sound great in your car. Fuck yeah. Because if it sounded great in your car, it'll sound better at home. Right always right so uh it was a great idea yeah and I, I i don't remember too many studios back then doing that right but the record plant was famous for it wow. and i looked it up not too long ago it's funny you mentioned it because i looked it up because i wanted to do that i wanted to get one of these things and they still they're out there and one of the people who used to make them you remember heath kit yeah where you get these kits, you, if you yeah. knew anything about soldering or anything, you could build these little things, and all kinds of different things. Joe Walsh loves those things. Right. Right? And, I, and Heath Kit used to make them. But I was kind of looking for a high-end company that made these things. And um, I found a couple, but, you know, it, they were real pricey, and, and I didn't know much about the company. All that, but it was a great idea to it do is. that. Man, when I was out in LA doing those rehearsals, learning the parts for the sh for the gig you got me on, yeah. thank you, the Walsh gig. Uh, we were at Joe's old house, uh, the one that Smokey lives in now. Oh yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, so it was me and Joe and Waddy trying to figure out like what the parts were right, going to be for right. what I was playing. And man, that house is stuffed full of ham radio yeah, equipment. Yeah, he's a ham freak. Total ham, ham radio. Freak. He's been doing ham radio since. God, since he lived in Kent in the 60s. Oh, my God. Uh, he had his ham ra er, license, and um, yeah. on the road, he, he brings, he, he strings wire from balcony to balcony on the hotel so he could hook up his antennas. And he's a ham radio nut, and he loves man. ham radio. You know? So cool. Yeah. So cool, man. Um, yeah, he's got a whole radio station up there. When you were growing up, uh, you know, who were your, who were your biggest influences, drummers? Well, I grew up in a jazz family, so Buddy Rich, I love Buddy yeah, Rich. Yeah. Gene Krupa, you gotta love Gene Krupa. Yeah. Um, uh, then, then, then Ringo Starr came along in 64, right. I love Ringo. Right. And also, I was a big Rascals fan, so mm -hmm. I loved Dino Donnelly. Everybody yeah. wanted to be Dino, he was the coolest drummer ever. Yes. And Dino Donnelly, then it got more serious. Then we got into, you know, and I always loved all the records Hal Blaine played on. Yeah. They were, he played on every record. Yeah, he did. And, and, and he, he always came up with these great, really creative drum parts. But, you know, then 68, 69, you know, there was uh, Ginger Baker, Cream, you know, I love Mitch Mitchell because Hendrix was coming on. But, but then John Bonham right. came around. And Carmine even with Vanilla Fudge, man, sure. he changed drumming a lot. Yeah. But when Bonham came out, I was like, oh God, this is this is a whole nother level. Oh you know, then then in the seventies there was a whole slew of guys, you know. But the early days, I love Ringo. Uh well, would and, you say Carl Palmer is your all time favorite? Yes. <laughs> yes, I would. <laughs> anyway. I mean talk about a group. Oh. Yeah, talk about a group. Yeah. yeah. But 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 the early days was uh, definitely Ringo, then Bonham, right. were the biggies. Right. Because Ringo, what a, what a group. But right. there was guys from Stax Records, totally. and, you know, and Motown, totally. and, and yeah. Al Green's Al guy. Green. I mean, those sure. guys were monsters. Man, dude. Uh, so, uh, that was so much fun playing yesterday. God, yeah, it was great. Yeah, we had a good time yesterday. It was really great to play, wasn't yeah, it? it was kind of e easy. It was easy. It was easy to, to find... We had the first take of the first song was Rockin' Pretty Good, wasn't it? Yeah. 
That was good. Yeah, it was good. All right, so my arm's getting pretty tired from holding this phone. Okay. Uh, and you got to play guitar. We're going to play guitar. What is something that you want the homeschoolers to know, if anything? Uh, you know, I, you want, I want them to know <laughs> that they need to watch your homeschooling YouTube channel forever. forever. If they ever even want to be a, a decent guitar oh, player, you got to watch. I, I, I'm not a guitar player. And I learned so much about guitar yeah. watching your. Thank you, bro. I, I don't know anything about it, but oh, I, I, the way you teach on that show, it's like it's 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 so valuable to guitar you, players. That's why it's so great, cause you're they actually learn from you. It's not a guy that goes, hey, watch this here, blah, 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 but never show them how you do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. not fair. Yeah, you know? yeah. And well, uh, so you, it's it's just awesome, and you know. COVID sucked. Right. It sucked. It did. But you know, it made you, we're already, I think we're all kind of creative people, yeah. all of us musicians. Yeah. And it made us create circumstances that, okay, right. fine, all right, well, what can we do with that? We didn't just go boo-hoo, I can't do anything now. Right. We actually got creative as in our soul, we are creative people. And what you did was just phenomenal. Thank and you, um, uh, it's a great, it's Thank funny. You, man. It's very informative. It's Thank educational, you. but it's 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 so it was so good for people that were dealing with COVID. Thank you, dude. I mean, it's been, it was good for me. I had nothing to do. Fuck. But it was, but it was the people that were like, "What the hell am I gonna do? Right. There's no gigs." Right. And it was a really a good escape. And, yeah, and that that was half of it. the other half is that they actually learned something yeah, you know, man. really great. Dude, so well, dude, I'm proud to be on dude, home school. Uh, dude, well, it means the world that you came down here and let me yeah, uh, man. let me talk to you a little bit, man. Uh, and now after we're done with this, I got to ask you a, a, how you what the name of the chord is and how you play it. Uh, I'll I'll show you later. It's on the song by Junior Walker and the All-Stars called Shotgun. Dude, I'm gonna learn it right now. <laughs> I'll learn it right now and I'll have it for you. Love you, Joe. All Thank right, you, man. buddy. See All right, you. man, see you.